Hello all, welcome to Physio TV channel. I am Dr. Pavandeep Kaur, Assistant Professor at Sanjeevi College of Physiotherapy. Today we will be talking about the, the discussion about arthritis and TKR rehabilitation. So earlier below before my talk, we have already seen a talk by Dr. Kailash Patil sir on arthritis and its management by TKR. So let's see the rehab aspect of this. So the objectives of this session will be first introduction to arthritis and how it affects the ADLs, then the risk factors of osteoarthritis, then management of arthritis, uh, total knee replacement. So what is total knee replacement and why it is important to do a pre-surgical rehabilitation and what are the aspects which we need to keep into consideration when we are seeing the post-surgical physiotherapy uh, rehab. And also at the end, we'll be covering the recent advances. So uh, based on the principle of evidence-based practice. So osteoarthritis is a leading cause of joint disability. Approximately 23% of the adults have osteoarthritis and it has, lim has caused limitation in their daily activities. Now, total knee arthroplasty has been one of the most successful means of treating patients with end-stage arthritis. While most of the patients have shown significant, they show pain uh, even post um, knee replacement. But yes, there has been some deficits, especially the deficits in functional performance and strength, which do persist even after a year uh, post-surgery. Now, uh, the main aim of undergoing TKR is to reduce pain and improve function so that all the ADLs can be achieved. Now, physiotherapy is very important. It plays a crucial role uh, in managing these patients. So our main aim is to optimize the post-operative outcomes, which are the strength, physical function, pain reduction, and return to normal activities of daily living. So what are the risk factors of osteoarthritis? Now, st starting with increasing age. So as our age increases, there are a lot of degenerative changes uh, due to repeated weight bearing, which has caused a wear and tear of the articular cartilage. Uh, obesity. So obesity also causes increasing joint loading force, which has led to early development of osteoarthritis. Female sex, trauma, infection, and repetitive occupational trauma are other factors which have led to uh, osteoarthritis. Now, we all know that before undergoing TKR, we do go for a conservative management where exercises and stretches are prescribed for knee osteoarthritis. To name a few, knee flexion exercise, hamstring stretch exercise, heel slides, hip extension to strengthen the glutes, up sitting up and down on the chair, so sit to stand exercises, then stair step up exercises, heel slides with focusing on terminal knee extension and sideline leg lifts, which is also used for strengthening your gluteus medius, so hip abductors strengthening. So these are the commonly prescribed exercises which are done by a physiotherapist. Now, management perspective, before we go for a total knee replacement, the non-operative uh, treatment is uh, tried in which non-pharmacologic -pharmac uh, therapy is given. So, where patient education is done. So, we do teach them uh, techniques where they have to avoid wearing excessive weight on the joint using a use of assisted devices weight loss has been suggested uh, aerobic exercises and hydrotherapy is prescribed for such patients then physiotherapy exercises are also prescribed in conjunction with occupational therapy so talking about the pharmacologic therapy so NSAIDs glucosamine sulfate intraarticular corticoids cortis cortis are also prescribed Now, what is total knee replacement? Now, when we know that in osteoarthritis, uh, the end stage is where there is complete wear and tear of the articular cartilage. The surgery which is done to, uh, to 
recover uh, from this is total knee replacement. What is done is uh, there are different types and there are various implants which are used in total knee replacement where the femoral component is replaced usually by the metal component. Then it is placed on the metal so plastic spacer uh, which is a part of the tibial component. So this is how a deceased bone, so the bone ends of the femoral cond condyle and the tibial plateau is cut and shape so that we can place the femoral component, which is the metal component, more, most commonly used. And the ceramic base is used where even a plastic spacer is placed and below that the metal place is placed. So this is how the implant is placed in a total knee replacement. So before a person undergoes surgery, it is recommended that we optimize the functional status of this patient so that we can have an early and a speedy post-surgical recovery. So this is a term which is a pre-surgical physiotherapy is commonly given uh, to any patient who is undergoing surgery. So the main aim is that it is focused on postural control, functional lower limb exercise and strengthening exercises for bilateral lower limb. Now, recent evidences have suggested that prehabilitation interventions have been initiated between 2 and 12 weeks before the scheduled TKR. Also, the content of this rehab program is varied. So it includes components such as strength and flexibility, followed by components to address task-specific training, balance motor learning agility, and patient education with focus on aerobic exercises were the main highlights of this program. Now, studies have also suggested that if we have a rehabilitation before undergoing TKR, it can reduce the length of stay after surgery as well as improve strength post-op which may also lead to better outcomes of pain, range of motion and ADLs. Now let us see some common exercises which are given for patients who are planning to undergo knee replacement. So the common exercises are hamstring isometrics, adductor isometrics, dynamic cords, then stra straight leg raising, quadriceps isometrics and short arc quadriceps. These are the most common exercises which are given for a person who is planning to undergo knee replacement. So once we are done with this, then we go for a little advanced program which includes inner thigh, lift, thigh leg lifts, straight leg raises, hamstring stretching, prone hip extension and clamshells. So basically these were open chain exercises where patient, where the strengthening of your adductors, hip abductors, hip extensors and hip flexors was done. Then we go for a partial, so we go for weight bearing exercises as well, which includes partial squats, step ups and calf raises. Now for improving strength, but we need to also focus on reducing the joint loading. We do not want the pain to aggravate. So there are exercises where, where hydrotherapy and aerobic exercises are prescribed for these patients. So it has also said that because of the buoyancy effect, there is decreased joint loading and the hydrostatic pressure due to the fluid also improves the blood flow and reduces the swelling. So it promotes healing of the tissues. That's why hydrotherapy has been recently used much often even in pre-surgical rehab of these patients. Now, post-surgical physiotherapy, in that we have to first do a subjective assessment, objective assessment, and which is based on using outcome measures. So these are the common outcome measures which are seen in the post-operative assessment and we also do a regular checkup uh, regarding, uh, the, regarding the progress. So basically when we want to do an aggressive rehab, whether we need to go for a low intensity training or a high intensity training, it all depends on how the patient is performing. So therefore we have the outcome measures of pain severity, flexion range of motion, extension range of motion. We also check the extensor isometric strength, flexor isometric strength, 
then six minute walk test, then cool scale for assessing pain, for assessing symptoms, assessing ADLs, and most important is quality of life. Because we want the patient to recover in all aspects, not only symptomatic, but also the patient should be able to return back to his work. So this is what is our main aim. So that's why we do regular assessment of the following outcome measures. Talking about the post-operative rehab. So on day one, we start with the bedside exercises, which includes ankle pumps, quadriceps sets and gluteal sets. These are the basic three exercises which we start post day one, post of day one. Now the weight bearing status is decided as per the implant which is put as per the pain level of the patient uh, and mostly it is a full knee weight bearing uh, post of day one. We make the patient stand, we check for stability uh, and for the muscle recruitment. Next is a very important bed mobility and transfer training. Now the patient has to be, gain independence in bed also. So we do train the patient turning uh, in the bed, getting up, so supine to sit and then sit to stand is our first aim. That the patient should be able to do at least functional bed, uh, bed mobility exercises. So the best exercises which we start with are ankle pumps, heel slides within the pain tolerance. Now all the exercises are done within pain tolerance. Okay, so prolonged knee stretch is usually started after day two, but we do start as per the pain tolerance of the patient. Now, when the patient is post-op day two, we start with active assisted exercise range of motion exercises or we start with active range of uh, motion exercises with focus on terminal knee extension. So it's very important to achieve the terminal knee extension in the early phase of rehab. And hence, strengthening exercises are also started, but they all are done within the pain-free limit. Now, very important is gait training. So gait training is usually started with assisted devices, such as the help of walker. And then we give them functional training from sit to stand and toilet transfer. Uh, bed mobility exercises. So, uh, when we do SLR, it is expected that we start with active assisted exercises uh, so that first the patient does not have a full direct muscle control. So, based on the muscle control of the patient, we start with SLR exercises, uh, hip abduction exercises, adduction exercises and also with the walker. So we train the patient to do hip reflection with walker and uh, use of parallel bar to train gait. Now when the patient is a post-op day 3 to day 5 or on discharge, we have to give progression of range of motion and strengthening exercises as per the patient's tolerance. Also, we do train patient for stairs and ambulation, so greater degree of ambulation with least rest restrictive devices. So we do try to give them uh, training with the help of walker and we train them for ADLs as well. Now, also there are evidence which suggests that if the muscle is not getting recruited, we do use NMES, neuromuscular electrical stimulation, for gaining better control and activation of the quadriceps muscle which is a very likely to go into inhibition. Now, when you consider the phase one rehab, which is up to two to three weeks, the main aim is first patient education. So in patient education, we tell the patient which activities he is allowed to do. For example, he is allowed to sit bedside, but he is not allowed to sit on the ground. He is not allowed to do full knee flexion and sitting cross-legged. Okay, so these are the basic instructions which we tell the patient. We also advise them to do walking inside the room for initial few days. And once he gains confidence, he's allowed to walk inside the house. 
So we tell them the importance of undergoing a rehabilitation from a trained physiotherapist so that he can cater to all the demands which are needed. For example, there may be cases where they are not getting full range of motion. So if there is a guided guidance by a physiotherapist, he can actually give them appropriate exercises and find out the cause for not getting the complete range of motion. So it is expected that a physiotherapist regularly visits them and gives them a guided protocol with the aim to minimize pain and swelling and gain independence in mobility and adherence. So we do want the patient to achieve passive and active knee flexion up to 90 degrees and maintain a full extension, which is the, which is the aim of first phase, right? And also the patient is uh, is walking full weight bearing. So we do want the patient to take equal weight on both the limbs. Now level one exercises which are usually given at home are quadricep sets, hamstring sets, SLR, bridging, knee extension, heel raises and buttock kicks. Now, if you see, all these exercises are basically used for activation and strengthening of your quadriceps, hamstring muscle, gluteus maximus, which is a hip extensor, your knee extensors, so basically the entire quadriceps, then calf raises, so calf raises are given so that there's proper pumping from the calf as well, and we do not develop any tightnesses as well in the calf and the hamstring. So these are the exercises which uh, are usually started. Ankle plantar flexion, dorsiflexion, which is called as ankle pumps. Then isometric knee extension in the outer range. Knee and hip flexion extension. Then bridging. So hip abduction, adduction. Then straight leg raises and isometric gluteal contraction. And inner range quadricep strengthening is also done using a pillow or a towel below behind the knee. Now, once the patient has completed phase one, in phase, uh, there is a criteria. So before we progress, patient should have knee range of motion of 90 degrees, full knee extension. Patient should be weight bearing equally on both the limbs, should have a complete control, mus good muscle control. So should be able to activate all the muscles. Now, in phase two, which is four to six weeks, we aim to have, patient should have no extension lag with good voluntary muscle control of the quadriceps because it, it's very likely that the muscle, that the quadriceps will go into a reflex inhibition or you say muscle guarding, right? Now our aim will be to improve and achieve 105 degrees of active knee flexion range of motion as well as should have full knee extension with minimal pain and swelling. For which we little go for an advanced knee strengthening where patient is asked to do hip flexion, inserting SLR, quadriceps strengthening, ham curl exercises are started and hamstring stretches are also continued. We also have an important component of patellar mobility. So regular assessment of patellar mobility has to be done by the therapist and we need to train and give patellar mobility exercises as well. Okay, then we focus more on closed chain exercises where knee stabilization exercises and resisted knee extension exercises are started using TheraBand. And for closed chain, we start with wall squats, keeping a ball in between the uh, in between the two knees so it's like a neuromuscular training as well as a close chain strengthening exercise now talking about the phase three once the patient has achieved all the following goals we will start with the phase three rehab which is six to eight weeks post-op so in this the exercises are started. First, we focus on functional exercises. So your lower limb functional exercises are given, which we can use by using PNF pattern, proprioceptive neuromuscular facilitation pattern training, which is very functional and it can be easily done by the patient. Uh, here, strengthening exercises are given to ensure hypertrophy beyond neural adaptation 
and we focus on balance and proprioception training because now the patient will be uh, going back to his work going back to his regular routine where the where there are elderly population who need training to go up to the market or go up to the temple so they need that basic balance so they need to have a good balance so hence we will focus more on proprioception and strengthening exercises now uh, training can be done in closed chain exercises as well so we use bozu ball for training balance so single leg balance exercises are given step down exercises are given then we use weight cuffs and thera bands as well for strengthening the abductors so main muscles which are focused are abductors hip extensors and knee flexors these are the three main muscles which we focus also not to forget quadriceps is one muscle which has to be trained throughout all the phases of rehab so these exercises which you see here, uh, wall squats, uh, single leg stance, uh, on the bozu ball, then using TheraBand to uh, have ex uh, good abductor strengthening. Then these are the very common exercises which are usually prescribed in phase 3. Talking about what are the problems. So basically when... A primary TKR has been reported. It has said that there should be, uh, we should aim to reduce the fall, improve balance related functions such as single leg standing balance. Also, we need to have good sensory orientation and postural control. So, the patient should feel that both the limbs are equal. So, the strength of the operated limb has to be uh, same as compared to the normal limb. Also, literature, literature highlights the importance of proprioceptive training and preoperative training uh, that involves a non-operated limb as well. Because when the patient is operated, he might, due to pain and due to inhibition, he may not take full weight on both the limbs. He may take more weight on the non-operated limb. Hence, we need to do a pre-surgical, pre-op training. Now, balance exercises stepping uh, are commonly which are prescribed are single leg balance, lateral step ups, standing on uneven surface and stepping over objects. Now, whenever we are focusing on balance, we need to also have an adequate knee control. So this is our main aim uh, to achieve a good muscle control of the knee muscles, which is usually done in around post-op eight weeks post TKR. care. Now your phase four will progress from 12 weeks, that is three months up to a year. Why this is very important? Because it is not like only till the time the therapist is prescribing exercises, the patient has to do the exercise. Patient has to continue to do all the rehabilit the entire rehabilitative program so that he is having independence in doing his community exercises. He should be able to do, he should be continuing with the exercise of strengthening, balance and proprioception. So this is very important. We have to educate them that the overall physical activity has to be such that the weight of the patient should not increase. So basically, there should be an adequate weight control as well as optimal strengthening and balance exercises have to be continued uh, even post of three months. For such patients, this will help in improving uh, the longevity of the implant as well as maintaining pain levels which is below uh, tolerance as well as having a good functional activity. Now there are many chances when the patient does not follow a rehab program or due to some reason is not able to be compliant to therapy. There can be chances of infection, polyethylene wear failure, instability, aseptic loosening, aseptic necrosis of patella, periprosthetic fractures. These are the various common causes when a TKR fails. And the most important is non-compliant to therapy. So therefore it's important so that we undergo a complete rehab program. Now can a patient do squatting? and cross leg sitting after TKR. This is a very common question which is asked by our patients that can we do squatting and cross leg sitting after TKR. Now the answer is that it depends. The amount of bending that a patient gets post uh, TKR is variable. It also depends on the amount of knee bending which was present 
before surgery that is the pre or uh, pre operative range of motion then the joint line position these are the factors which determine the ability of squatting then the quality of bone how much is the degeneration which is there how much weight the bone can bear is also an important factor then the status and strength of the ligaments that is the collateral ligaments of lcl and mcl if your knee is deformed into genovarum or genovargus we do do a strengthening we do have we have corrected the alignment with a change in the uh, collaterals as well because if there is any uh, deformity the length of the ligaments also changes so accordingly uh, lengthening of the uh, tight uh, collaterals is also done during the surgery then the type of implant which is used so there are various types of implants like metal on metal metal on ceramic ceramic on metal so there are different implants which are used metal on metal has suggested that it allows a greater degree of range of motion however it is usually done for younger patients not for elderly population and the most common which we are doing is metal on ceramic or metal on uh, metal on ceramic which is most commonly uh, done surgery also the post op rehab which is very important so whether physiotherapy was done adequately and patient has gained uh, such, uh, a good amount of range which is beyond 90 degrees as well and also people who are overweight may not get full flexion in their knees now this is also some one question that like some patients do achieve full range of motion and some don't so what can be the reason this is a very common question which is asked to us now there are factors which determine the squatting ability in tkr one is the patient related factors which is age bmi and pre operative range of motion right so this is pre op now talking about post op uh, processes related factors are what was the model of processes whether patella resurfacing was done whether there was a patella baha after tkr what whether there is a joint line elevation then changes in the pco okay so these are common uh, uh, common questions which are asked and this are, these are the factors so what is pco pco is posterior condyle offset so statistics have suggested that age processes size and preoperative range of motion were correlated with squatting ability so these were the main factors which have uh, have dictated that this determines how much the patient will be able to bend post op There were some evidences which have said that age and patellar replacement did not affect the post-op range of motion, whereas BMI had a negative influence on the post-operative joint range of motion, right? So, these, this was in one of the studies. It was also uh, found out. They have also found out that the knee society knee score was significantly higher in patients who gained weight, whereas the patients who lost weight had better gain in function. Now, patella baha has been said to affect the patellar patellofemoral joint motion and a shortening of more than 10% of the tendon has been hypothesized to significantly reduce the knee flexion range due to shortening of the knee extensor mechanism length. So, that's why it's optimal to consider all these factors when we are trying to determine whether the patient will have a good squatting ability in post tkr now what are the complications after a tkr problems with wound healing there can be some issue with the wound healing then dvt infection bleeding swelling and post operative stiffness with persistent pain are the common complications which are seen post tkr now, why do we need to know some recent evidences? Uh, recently, high-intensity rehab program has been 
shown that it significantly has shorter short greater short term and long term strength and performance enhancement as compared to a low intensity program so we are achieving greater benefit if we do a high intensity program so it is usually started immediately after discharge and also we do not compromise like with any of the knee range of motion outcomes which can cause pain or increase the pain in this group so we do have to see the knee range which is available and the pain level of the patient as well the key difference between the two programs were a greater number of treatment sessions over a longer period and the use of machine based assisted exercises and higher level of functional exercises now clinical practice guidelines now we do have clinical practice guidelines for tkr as well so total western western ontario and mcmaster university osteoarthritis index which is womax subscales they include pain function function and stiffness so and the sf36 which is the short form survey uh, 36 item questionnaire where physical function scores have shown improvement post one and three months uh, post op with a regular preoperative training. Now, modified WOMAC, which includes mainly pain and stiffness, and pain was uh, and function. So, pain was assessed using a VAS, so which also improved in post op one and three months. Uh, with patients who had undergone a preoperative quadricep muscle exercise. So what I'm trying to say is if we do a proper preoperative strengthening, there is improvement in pain, function and uh, stiffness. So we also checked, there were studies which have also checked SF36 physical function component score, which also showed an improvement at three months post-op. Now, cool score is also an very important outcome questionnaire because it deals with activities of daily living, uh, which has shown improvement at six weeks and three months post-op with proper pre-operative physical training. Now, the other outcome measures which we usually assess are the Euro QOL score, which has five dimension questionnaire and the VAS score, which has also shown a very good improvement. So the aim of uh, saying all this is that for improving our functional activity level, pain and stiffness, we do need to have a pre-operative training, which is more focused on quadriceps and hamstring muscle strengthening. So there have been various scales which assess the length of inpatient stay. So it, have, it was shown that patients who have undergone a preoperative training had reduced length of inpatient stay. Also, we had done some balance assessment test as well. So stair test and TUG test, which is timed up and go test, were also showing good results. Then Biodex overall stability index score also improved at six weeks post-op surgery and knee flexion range of motion also had greater improvement with pre-op training. So whenever we give a pre-op training, we also focus on mobility, flexibility, and strength. So all these three factors are taken into consideration whenever we are giving a pre-operative training. So whenever we give strengthening, as I said, we use more of hydrotherapy and aerobic exercises, uh, also joint specific exercises. So we have uh, seen in, uh, improvement in quadricep strength, isometric hip abduction strength and isometric knee flexion strength post-op uh, at one and three months post-surgery. Now there are uh, factors which a physiotherapy. So basically, whenever we take any management, it has to be taken into consideration the following factors which determine your prognos prognosis, your treatment, and your informed decision making and expectation setting with patients undergoing TKR. This is very important because patients do ask us when should we return to our work. So we need to assess certain factors uh, and take into consideration uh, how much time a patient will take to go back to their work. So if there is a higher BMI, it is associated with more post-operative complication and worse post-op outcomes. 
Depression is also associated with the worst post-operative outcomes. Depression can be due to lack of patient's ability to go to independence. Basically, when the patient is undergoing surgery, he may have for some time to be dependent on another person for her for his or her basic activities as well. So there are times when patients do have depression. Now, pre-operative range of motion is positively associated with post-op range. So, if we if we have a better pre-op range, we do expect a better post-op range as well. Pre-operative physical function is also associated. So, if what was the functional level of the patient before surgery also helps in determining the post-op rehab. The pre-operative strength also determines a post uh, is also determining how the patient will recover post-op. Now, age associated with mixed patient reported outcome. So, it is not uh, it is not proven that age will always, like the more elderly person will have more uh, loss of function. It is not positively correlated, but yes, performance-based and impairment-based outcomes definitely tell us that we have a mixed response. Diabetes has not actually uh, have any correlation direct, like it is not associated with worst outcomes, but yes, it does delay the healing of the patient. And a greater degree of comorbidity is associated with worst patient reported outcome as well. So I read one article in which they have suggested that supervised physical therapist management should be provided uh, for patients who have undergone TKR and there should be optimal setting which is determined by patient safety, mobility, environmental and personal factors. Also, they can use group-based or individualized based physiotherapy sessions for patients undergoing TKR. Now, uh, PT management should start within 24 hours of the surgery and prior to the discharge uh, for patients who have undergone TKR. Now, it is a consensus uh, that we do collect uh, Coos JR, which is Coos joint replacement as a patient rated outcome. And also we do perform 30 seconds sit to stand and TUG test for checking the performance based outcome. So this is the most common scales which are used for assessing outcome post PKR. Thank you. I would like to thank Dr. Parak Sanjeti sir, chairperson of Sanjeeti Group of Physiotherapy for providing uh, me with this opportunity and also under the constant guidance and support of Mrs. Manisha ma'am, Dr. Apurva Shimpi sir, principal for giving me this opportunity and our technical team and of course all our loyal viewers. Thank you and see you next time.